Hello. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, this is the project is called the Decolonized Self. Although, um, Professor, you posted something today. What was it? Re um, indigenizing, <laughs> which is a which uh, for me these terms are kind of interchangeable. But it is, but there's something in terms of the action of re doing something as to de doing something. So I'm very I could almost say it's the decolonized self moving toward the re indigenized self. In, in many ways, because uh, if, if uh, people are like, "What what is decolonization, and mm -hmm. why is it important? Why how, how do you what does it even mean?" Um, it's an emerging field, and people are people are still exploring it. So, I was I had an opportunity to kind of say, "Well, here's how I would approach it," you know, and it's based based on a lot of my experience with indigenous elders and what I learned <coughs> from them. Um, and so, I started off with an autoethnographic project that involved uh, a lot of writing. I actually, completed an autobiography this summer. Mm -hmm. That needs a couple of revisions. I've been working on other sort of pieces of media in and around as a way of kind of bringing bringing the, the project uh, more full. Um, in the in terms of the the types of things that I've been collecting, you know, uh, it's very it's very personal. It's all very personal, and it's also extremely general. As well, so it's these different spheres, and I'll and I'll and I'll work toward those as, as we move in. So it involves things like family history and a personal journey, and relationships, and you know, education, vocation, worldview events. Um, this is the types of things that I was that I was writing about initially, um, just to kind of like as to, to prime myself for where are the areas that, that I wanted to explore. I've been collecting uh, media, different types of media around around the issue, and this has been going on for a number of years, even before, and that's really why I came back to school was to really go more in depth on this the thesis because I was enjoying it so much and I wanted to be in a you know an atmosphere that really uh, targeted. So uh, part of it is also getting into the collective memory, like moving, moving and organizing and collaborating, refining, going into existing archives, whether they be formal or informal. Sometimes they're personal, like I've tracked down these distant cousins who have these amazing, <laughs> these amazing archives and you know they're lending me their materials and they're helping kind of fill out this this story that I that I've been exploring. Um, media artifacts and, and historical sites, there's actually a lot of really great, and I also wanted to engage these tools that are available now, because there's a lot of these really innovative tools, mm -hmm. and so a lot of it is also kind of like, this is a good excuse to play, you know, like play with DNA and genealogy and things like that, and see see where things are in terms of development. And that is that is the other thing, was the, the DNA, was the, so I sent samples of the DNA, and I had different types of tests done, I had medical tests done, I had, you know, um, the lineage test done, and what and what they do in DNA is they track uh, haplogroups, which is where genes actually mutate, and it's mapped. It's really interesting because when you get your report, it's on a global map, so you can actually see the migration of your DNA across the globe. It's oh, it's very very cool. Um, and then the other you know the other factors that work into that, like why why is my DNA migrating across the globe? You know, and that and that pulls into like colonization. And, you know, Indigenous displacement, migration, and then into epigenetics. Those are the inherited um, memory within our DNA. So, if you're the the working theory around this is say, and, and so in my case, so like I have ancestors coming from Ireland who migrated as a result of um, the Great Hunger, what is sometimes inappropriately referred to as the famine, because it wasn't a famine; it was an act of genocide. Um, so this this plays into that as well, so that there are residual memories that actually we respond to um, that we're po quite possibly not aware of. It's something that happened to our ancestors, and we can be triggered in our environment and, and live out and have emotional um, responses to stimuli that, that is similar. Um, so those, that's my methodology. That's what I kind of mapped out at first. Like these are the types of tools and things that I want to do, and and I definitely wanted to go into the field, but then I really needed to narrow it down. I really needed because there's so many rabbit holes within genealogy, especially a, my family. These people breed like crazy, um, <laughs> so that I was like, okay, I need to kind of really kind of rein it in because otherwise this would get really un unyieldy. And um, going, you know, going back to um, the mono myth, which is which is one of one of my framings, which is a very classic work of Joseph Campbell. Um, it's a, wonderful um, researcher who just went out in the field, collected all these mythologies, and was really looking for how stories are structured because it actually impacts our response to it. We all know like this, there's that, like, you build your story up here, and you build it in one, you come down, but like, why? And so he read everything, and he was looking for the similarities, and he developed a working model called the hero's journey, which is that process of, and we use it in, we use it in everything, like film and media, because we're so kind of entrained to this way of thinking, to kind of introducing characters and building the stories and working toward this 
you know, thing that then suddenly worked there that will eventually work its way to a resolution. Classic films, Lord of the Rings, you know, Star Wars, all of these films are, are based on it. Pretty much you can take just about any film, book, whatever, and you can you can use a hero's journey model to kind of dissect it. So I so I really was attracted to that and also have a lot of experience with the hero's journey because in, in my work with the Wisdom of the Elders, we went into the field, we collected oral histories from native elders. We were very curious how these people were so healthy considering everything. These, a lot of people were taken from their homes as children. You know, they were like, beaten if they spoke their language or practiced their culture, they were being forced into an assimilation process. And so we were curious, like, how did you recover? You know, what did you learn? What could you tell? What could you tell other people? And they were all giving us similar responses was that they had to go back and reclaim their identity, they had to go back and reclaim their indigenous self, reclaim their culture. And they did it through a lot of different ways. So maybe it may be ceremonial, it could be it could be it could be diet, it could be it could be ceremonial practices, it could be play, it could be ritual. Um, and because it's so individual, it's so personalized that there's not like a cookie cutter way of necessarily having to do this. It's definitely a personal, a personal journey to embark on. And that's why I like the, the hero's, the hero's journey, because it does, it does present the person who's doing the research. It kind of invites you to step into this like wondrous exploration and, and discovery and to imagine yourself as the hero in your own, in your own journey. And so it stay, it keeps you, it keeps, I would say it keeps me very positively focused you know, in terms of the research, you get, you get very excited about like discoveries. The indigenous worldviews specifically, and I've mentioned, I've mentioned some of these before, um, it's really these values that have been conveyed to me by indigenous elders. That's really at, at the heart of the work. Um, one of them is this phrase, and it's, and it's been referenced in a book, and, it's, it's, um, and I think you guys heard me say stories as medicine, and I was having this conversation with Donja where like maybe that's kind of hard for, for people not as familiar to kind of make that leap because even medicine means something completely different. So I picked this phrase instead because I think it's more accessible and it's, uh, you are the story you keep telling yourself. So you're basically, you know, you're creating your own reality because you're telling yourself like, I'm this person, I'm this way, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. But how did you come to that point? You know, how did you come to be saying these things about yourself as sort of, you know, a definitive identity? So it touches on the the traditions of land-based peoples, of indigenous peoples as being close and connected to the land. So one of the very first things I was absolutely curious about when I got these online subscriptions to these DNA things is I was like, okay, where were the land-based people in my lineage who were there for a long time that got displaced? You know, so I intentionally dug back until I found, you know, there was like a thousand years where people along my grandma's lineage like lived on this land and then slowly over 500 years they were, they were pushed out. And they went through this process very similar to the book in, um, in the, the figure of the migrant, mm -hmm. you know, where like <laughs> they became political outlaws, they became barbarians, they, they, you know, they were turned into all these different things and trying to, and trying to go back to their land and eventually they, they gave up and they left and they migrated somewhere else. Uh, the, other, the other value is self-determination and this, this comes up a lot in, in uh, indigenous circles and, and with elders that I speak to and it, it's very key to where if you think about, you know, a colonizer coming in and completely disrupting your way of life, like we're going to teach you our language, you're going to practice our culture, you're not going to live where you used to live, you're not going to eat the foods that you're used to eating. Um, this is a very clear statement of like, no, I'm deciding my own life. I'm deciding my own path. This is, this is me making all those choices. People can have their outside influence, but ultimately it's me, it's my life, and I'm going to, I'm going to live it the way that I want. So it's, it's really a... Uh, a call for personal uh, sovereignty. And so I, these things are really very much contextually on my mind throughout uh, the process. So the framing, as I, as I alluded to earlier, uh, seven generations, I chose seven generations as my starting point because I found uh, a family that had come over right before the Revolutionary War. The sons got enlisted into the war. And if, you know, if you're an uh, immigrant to a new country, you, uh, there's ways in which you want to assimilate. The United States is really good at taking, you know, people kind of fresh off the boat, you know, especially a lot of the Irish that were coming over in the early years and, and, and other, uh, from other countries and putting them in the military with the promise of land because the government couldn't afford uh, to pay these people. So they would promise them land. So in this first generation, um, the boys survived and they did get a land grant from the government. And this sort of rooted us here in the United States. And there's actually still to this day a, a family farm. Um, and so part of it is, yeah, walking these ancestral pathways that I've been a 
part of, like going to these six-store sites, like towns and places where my ancestors lived, you know, locating, I've been finding these long-lost cousins to help me along their research, or they just sort of pop up on the way because someone's like, oh, you need to talk to so-and-so, and they'll direct me over to somebody else. Um, and then a lot of it is like I now am like writing with some cousins that I, you know, like who were saying, oh, I heard, you know, and they're writing me letters because they don't, they're not on the internet <laughs> because they're older, and, and they'll send me information of stories that they know, and they'll ask me questions about my research. So it's, it's very, it's a very stimulating uh, process, and it's a lot of fun because there's there's so many uh, reference points with these strangers. You know, like we have these stories, and the story is what makes the connection. And this is the story I came I came up with to to start introducing myself to these distant cousins, or I should say, this is the story that found me that has allowed me as a calling card to like say, "Hi, you don't know me, but I'm trying to figure out about this," and they're like. Oh, well, come in, have a seat. You know, I've been treated to all this wonderful Southern hospitality, but let's talk about family. And so specifically, it was about this statue, which I saw first in 1987, and it had a huge impact on me. I was a senior in high school. My grandpa died, and they said, we're going to Mississippi for the funeral. And I'm like, why are we going to Mississippi? I had no idea that my grandpa was from Mississippi and that we had all these family in Mississippi. And they're like, well, that's where he's from. And I'm like, okay. So we drive to this town, and... You know, they're telling me stories like, you know, he grew up on a block with 41st cousins. I'm like, what? And I'm like, yeah. They were like, yeah, we populated that whole town, you know. And, and, um, and then we get there, and I saw the statue, and I think my dad wrongly identified it as a, as a grandfather. He's actually the son of a grandfather. So in my research, I thought, oh, this is cool. And I pulled it up, and then I found out he was actually a great uncle. So I kind of pushed it to the side. I was like, he's not in my, my generation group, so I'm just really not going to pay a lot of attention to this. And then this popped up online, which is his, which is his barrel plot, which isn't in the town that he's from. You know, even though the family has a plot there, it's in another city, and it's an unmarked grave in one of the most expensive cemeteries in New Orleans. But it's so like trying not to be seen, trying not to be noticed, and it's surrounded by these opulent, <laughs> oh my God, crazy, crazy like tombstones and structures and stuff like that. And this name Benson, not a family name. And I'm like, I saw it online, and I was like, well. I'm going to be going down to New Orleans. I'll just hike out to that cemetery. I'll, I'll find the right grave. I'll take a picture, and I'll correct this. And it turns out, no. I did the research. He really did live there. And I met local historians, and they, ver and they verified it. And it turned out that he's buried in there with another man, a man that he shared residence with for many, many years. And I was like, oh, so is Uncle Willie gay? That was my next thing. So then that was the next question. So then I went back to Brookhaven and revisited, because the, there's no inscription here on the story, but he, uh, he has an inscription. This is a one-minute video that I, that I got out of, out of a cousin's archive. This is taken in the late 80s, early 90s. They asked two, two of the like, southern you know, women in the family to just walk around the town, and they, someone had their first video camera, and they're like, tell us about the town. So they're going all over the town and saying, this is where so-and-so lived. It goes on for hours. Well, then they get to this statue, and here's where it gets, <laughs> here's where it gets interesting. Audio's a little rough at the start, but then they, they, they get better at it. So. It's short, but it'll give you a, a sense of actually what the family knows about it or didn't know. Uncle Richard, I asked the council hall, his So the, the, I'll, I'll, say it, I'll say it again. It's actually a segment I found from a poem. And, and so what's inscripted, and this is the only inscription left that he, that he left in the memory, is, I pray thee then remember me as one that loves his fellow men. And, I, and it's actually from a poem about, about a man who's very concerned about going to heaven. 
and an angel is taking these, writing all the names of the people going to heaven, and he's like, is my name on there? No, sorry. And then, and then the, he's like, well, okay, this is the poem. Write me then as, uh, I pray thee then remember me as one who loves his fellow men. And then the next day the angel appears and that person's name is on the top of the list. So this is the only little scrape of, you know, insight into his actual character that, you know, that I got. Um, there's still, this is a registered landmark with the Smithsonian. And it always kind of blew my mind. I was like, someone in my family got a monument? Like, what? And actually realizing through, through investigating this that, that this had way more to do with how he wanted to be remembered and how he wanted to be seen. So taking that inspiration has led me to the presentation because, because he wasn't able to actually speak for himself and he was living, a, he was living as a queer man you know, down in New Orleans in a, you know, more than 100 years ago at a time, where, probably one of the safest places in the nation to live as a queer person. But at the same time, like, there's no language. You know, like, if you think about it, everything was encoded. Everything was encoded because like, gay, the term gay wasn't used yet. Like, homosexuality hadn't come into popularity and stuff like that. So in the, it, he inspired me to actually go back to my first love, which I was writing plays as a little kid and performing plays as a little kid. I'm like, that's, that's really, I think that's what needs to happen. Like, I need to engage this in a way where there's performance. Because identity is performed. It's something, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of the working theories around it. It's also a mediated, identity is mediated. So for the purpose of the project, the stage functions <coughs> as the world. So this is, this is like the world that's been set up. It's the world that I come into. Like I didn't really have, you know, I wasn't involved in its construction. The, the setting itself is more the collective. It's more the collective input, you know, family, community, things like that in terms of what happens. And then the artist, which is, you know, from the writer, the director to the actors, is what helps it through the relationship and in, and in the stage setting actually present itself. And so that is... Um, this is the lead up to the play, which I posted 20, you know, like 20 pages on, um, Home Seekers Paradise. That's the project as it stands right now. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I'm a broken record, I'm so sorry, but 